I actually drove all the way here from San Francisco. I work at a company called PubNub. It's on uh, Folsom and Third Street, and I work in developer relations. My name is Jordan Schutz. Um, and a little bit of background about me. Uh, I've been basically a video game developer since about like 16 or 17 years old. I made some really popular video games for uh, the Nintendo Wii U and other consoles. So that's kind of what I've done. And um, it actually paid my way through college doing it, which is pretty sweet. So I got to be a video game developer in college and make money and, and pay, to f pay for school. And now I'm working at PubNub. So um, today I'm going to be giving a talk um, basically on how you can use an Arduino board to like power your home's IoT devices. And this is my little demo that I'm going to be kind of showcasing at the end. Um, also, by the way, on the microphone, it's a little echoey, just so you turn down a little bit. Thanks. Um, so back, I, I kind of wanted to bring this all the way back to 2009. Uh, this is a project that I worked on in school. Um, when I was in high school, I basically had the opportunity to be a part of a team that was in charge of basically sending an experiment to outer space, which was super awesome. So the project's goal was to see if we could basically grow plants in space. And we called it like a cube lab experiment. Essentially, uh, the Chinese uh, government has this program where you can basically send stuff up to outer space if you pay like a flat rate. So the school actually funded this, this project and like I got to join, which was super awesome. And so I basically got hands-on training on how to use the software free PCB, if you guys have ever heard of it. And I was tasked with basically creating the lighting system for this, uh, for this cube lab experiment. And so after about like a month or two of work, I actually successfully created this board. And I sent it in to be made at the, the factory. And this is kind of what I got back. So what I had to do is I just had to take the components and solder them onto the board. And so all those are little LED lights. And then they're like resistors, capacitors, and then the little thing to connect to the main logic board. So I, I created this myself when I was like 16. It was, it's super awesome looking back and seeing like where IoT devices are going. So this, this is kind of like the experiment. Um, basically, I also got to work on the main logic board, which connected uh, to the lighting. And then this was the little glass box where basically you would put soil and we put seeds. And so um, basically the soil and the plants were supposed to grow in this box. And it, this is like the almost completed project. This isn't the final version. Essentially, it was put in this like metal box that was sent up to the International Space Station. And so what the astronauts would do is every day they would uh, plug in their USB to the, to, the, um, to the logic board. And then they would basically uh, like collect the data and then send that data back down to us so we could basically check out like if the plants were growing in space. So it, it was a pretty cool high school project that I got to be a part of. Um, and I learned a lot about kind of like hardware engineering and IoT. And so I'm, I guess you guys are assuming that our project was a massive success and the plants grew in space. Well, nope, they died. Uh, they never grew. Uh, and the reason was is the type of plastic that we actually used back here, apparently, Whoever picked it out, it was the wrong type of plastic, and it actually released toxins into the soil, which basically prevented the seeds from growing. So it was actually a really good learning opportunity, and, and that's just some of my background with like, doing that kind of stuff. And it was just a cool little project that I want to show you guys. So really, like, even when, from a young age, like, I always really had this huge fascination, fascination uh, with hardware and software development. And over the years, like, I've basically been just really excited on seeing how everything is becoming smart and how it's helping people basically like improve their lives, right? When we look, um, like I think by 2020, uh, it's estimated there's gonna be 21 billion uh, connected devices to the internet, which is huge. And IoT, which is, if you guys are familiar, stands for Internet of Things, um, will basically be a huge part of how we interact with basic everyday objects. Uh, I just know that like when I have kids one day, um, they're gonna be like saying, okay, Google, you know, make me popcorn, and the popcorn's going to be making, and I'm going to be like, why can't I just plug it into the wall and, you know, press a button? So it, it's, it's, it's really just going to change the way that we interact with everyday objects that we never thought would be normally connected to the Internet. Um, and just in a year alone, we went from 5 million IoT devices to billions. So it's just a huge jump in the last, like, few years, and all these devices are connected to the Internet. So we basically need to think about how we're handling, uh, handling these devices. And really, the future is happening now, and the devices are getting smarter every day. 
So another awesome fact about IoT is it's really transforming like the cities that we live in, and, and they're becoming smart. Um, cities are becoming more efficient. Like at stoplights, uh, they're basically you know syncing uh, peak traffic times by basically collecting data, and uh, they're basically improving cities' efficiency by making traffic better, um, and they're saving the economy both time and money. And having the ability to remotely manage all these devices is actually really important. And like when we look at like artificial intelligence and like it's gonna become the norm and smart home hubs, thermostats, lighting system, coffee makers, they're all gonna collect your data and, you're on, and they're gonna collect your data on your habits and patterns of usage and all this data is gonna help facilitate machine learning and they're gonna learn more about you and then advertisers are gonna be able to you know, ping you when your coffee maker is you know, at a coffee or, or something like that. So everything's becoming smarter. So I know I just told you guys that you know, every IoT device will, become, will be collecting data and learning about your usage patterns, but I really don't want you guys to be scared. Just look at how cute this coffee pot is. How can this <laughs> be harmful to you, right? IoT devices are really awesome, and the future really is like this kind of coffee pot. Made by Steven, he uh, posted it on hackaday.com, and I just thought it was really cool. I wanted to share it with you guys. Basically, this coffee maker uses Alexa on a Raspberry Pi, and what it does is it has an audio splitter, and basically, when you, when you like talk to it, it, it collects that data and to the Arduino, and the Arduino uses an amplitude of the audio signal to basic, like the, the amplitude of the positive signals to basically determine how much to open the mouth of the coffee pot. So when you talk to it, it'll, it'll talk back to you. And the brewing of the coffee is also controlled by the Arduino so that when you say like, Alexa, make me coffee, it'll insert the coffee filter and then it will scoop up some coffee into the container. And so pretty soon our coffee makers are gonna become advanced AI robots that will talk to you and take commands via voice. So let me, let me show you this video because I just thought it was, it was a pretty neat little Arduino project that somebody hacked together. I don't know if the volume would work. What's the weather? It's 32 degrees with cloudy skies. Throughout the day, you can expect more of the same. With a high of 37 degrees and a low of 23 degrees. <laughs> so obviously that didn't work the best, but I, I think it's just, it was just a funny little thing that somebody made and wanted to share. Yep. <laughs> So really IoT devices, let me, let me go back to make this full screen here. Cool. So when we look at like how, how mainstream these IoT devices are becoming, they're really everywhere in today's like electronics culture. And they're, they're so mainstream that Target in San Francisco basically opened up a store on 4th Street that basically sells all of the most recent IoT devices. And it's called Target Open House. And they basically have everything from Google Homes to Alexas to a smart baby crib that basically detects if your baby is asleep, awake, like moving around. Um, there's just tons of cool stuff that this Target sells, but it, it obviously is able to stay in business, so it's doing well, and people are coming in and purchasing these IoT devices. And it's selling thermostats, security cameras, you know, the list goes on. And what, what's actually really awesome about this store is most of these devices that are on sale actually are powered by PubNub right here. Um, and there's multiple reasons why these companies decided to use PubNub instead of going with their backend solutions. And so I'm just gonna like kind of talk about um, some of the hurdles that, that these companies face when uh, they're trying to develop like an IoT device and how we kind of solve their, their issues. So if you guys haven't heard about PubNub, we are a globally distributed pub sub network that has a really, really simple API that you can pick up and learn. Um, and PubNub basically supports bi-directional communication, which means devices can send and receive data between the devices. And we use like intelligent data routing, which means we can route the device data back to like any existing system like AWS, IBM, um, um, IBM and like Microsoft Power BI. And in this example, this is just some code of how easy PubNub really is. 
um, we basically publish the message to a channel, and then any device that's subscribed to that channel will just receive that published message in real time. So that's, that's how simple, that's just the JavaScript SDK, but that's basically how these devices can talk to each other using the PubNub SDK. Um, so we, we support over 70 SDKs, including Arduino, Raspberry Pi, and many more. Um, and this is very important since if your IoT device needs to be connected uh, like with other platforms, like let's say you want to create a mobile application like for iOS or you want to create a web app to basically interact with your IoT device, um, you can basically build your entire stack with PubNub and we handle all the back end for you so you don't even have to worry about it. And you don't have to set up any of your own servers and, we, and it's really easy to get PubNub up and running. And so, in addition, like setting up like a global secure network is really a huge feat. And many companies, they just simply don't have the resources to basically keep an expensive, reliable operation up and running. And that's part of the reason why many come, like basically choose to go with PubNub. And in addition, making the communication between devices secure can really be a challenge, which is what I'll get into right now about just how important security is really in like the, the IoT and our, like in the IoT space. So with all these devices like listening and connecting to the open internet, we, we need encryption, right? Um, we can't just leave a port open on our router and let people access that. Like we, we need some sort of encryption when all these devices are, are connected to the open internet. And when we look at TLS and SSL, these really don't cut it for encryption and processing because basically those are point to point solutions and they're not end to end solutions. And when you think about the data, they have, it has to go through many different points on the chain. And so, you know, you may have basically many different layers with different vendors um, and devices in the chain with different security protocols, and you want that data to basically flow through the internet and be secure so that nobody can access it. And you really just need encryption for the full data lifecycle. And so, when we look at like AES encryption, right, it's really a great choice to basically provide end-to-end -end security. And with AES, you can strongly encrypt like the entire message all the way through, um, since only devices with those encryption keys can basically decrypt and encry en encrypt the data as it's sent and received. And a lot of chip companies already have AES built in. Um, but often we don't need to inspect and process the message along the way. And if the message is encrypted, it can be very hard to do. So in order to encrypt the message, you basically have to split the message into a body and an envelope. And what you can do is you can encrypt the contents of the message and the body so that nobody can read or act on it th basically throughout the pipe and then put actionable data around it as part of the envelope. So um, like the message body will be basically wrapped in AES, but then we can also wrap the data in TLS um, to basic, so that we can basically read that data. Um, so in the case of the picture, right, the temperature data that we're trying to send from an IoT device uh, basically has been wrapped in TLS and can be read. Um, however, whatever is in the envelope um, cannot be accessed without the AES encryption key. So that basically keeps these IoT devices secure so that people can't access your data. Um, yeah. So obviously we can't let these IoT devices listen to each other on the open internet. And so to prevent this, we need to make sure we prevent all inbound um, open ports at all costs. And when you leave ports open on your router, it really like leaves devices susceptible to like DDoS attacks and other vulnerabilities. And devices really should only be making outbound connections. So that way the door is closed to accessing applications and services behind these open ports. So um, the connection outward can be left open so the device can listen in with a secure tunnel back from the network. And the, the problem with the internet, right, is that we can't just assume things will work because connections, they fail all the time, right? You're going through a tunnel with 4G or Wi-Fi and like you basically drop connection. How do you know that that packet of information that you sent to that device reached that device successfully? There's really like, it, because if that, if that device dropped connection, you won't get a return packet knowing if they actually received it. There's a ton of different things that could happen. And it's a, it's a really hard problem to fix since the device really will never receive the callback and the device didn't receive the message. So the next step to kind of like solve this is people immediately, they think, okay, let's try polling. I don't know if you guys have heard about polling, but basically polling doesn't scale. And the issue is, is polling creates additional bandwidth requirements along with battery drain. So essentially this is the, the, the device basically saying, are you there, are you there, are you there? And then 
when it doesn't receive that, that callback, then it, then it basically knows that it's not there. But um, th this is just a hard problem to solve. So basically what we solved at PubNub is we, it, this can all be fixed and handled with the publish subscribe paradigm. Um, essentially, you can send info through MQTT, WebSockets, streaming HTTP, and it allows these connections to be secure. However, many of these protocols, like MQTT, WebSockets, et cetera, um, they have issues when we're talking about massive scale. We're talking about like millions of devices connected. Um, it, it, there's just a lot of issues where like it, th that, that, that just haven't been solved. So basically, we have a whole team here at PubNub dedicated to solving these scaling issues. Um, base, and it basically helps companies solve, solve their issues. Um, and we use the publish subscribe model. And the publisher, how, how it works is the publisher is given a token. And then the subscriber is given a read token. And then each token can be revoked at any time. And tokens can also have an expiration, or like also known as like a timeout, right? Um, and each token can be set to work with only certain data streams. So in this case, it's a channel name. So if you're publishing to a channel you know, called IoT House, you, know, you can basically secure that with a token so that only, only me with the token can be sending data to the house. We don't want other people to go on that channel and then be able to send that information. So that's essentially kind of what you're able to do. Um, and the benefit is that the network basically becomes a traffic cop, so you can control what data is going in and out of the network um, remotely. So there are many companies that have basically tried to implement their own solutions. Um, this one, it, and then, then they've ended up going with PubNub because they can't solve the scaling issues. And so Insteon was a company, it was founded in 2005, and it has over 200 home automation products. And so customers can basically use their smartphone and the Insteon hub to turn on and off lights, lock doors, view cameras, um, and they basically can receive instant alerts from uh, whether they're in home network or on like or remote in real time. And so in the beginning when Insteon created their company, um, they released the first set of devices. And it, what Insteon would require you to do, it was, it was insane. They would make you pick up the phone, call them, and be like, talk to their support. Support would walk through like a mom or a little kid on, okay, you have to go and open up a port on your router and you have to open up this port for this device to work and it just wasn't like, it just wasn't a good solution. Um, it was basically time consuming. It was a bad customer experience. Plus it left their customers open to DDoS attacks. Um, and that's why they came to PubNub and were like, hey, we need a better solution. And so it, like, what they originally built is they built uh, their solution on HTTP to communicate between the Insteon hub and the clients like iOS and Android apps. And the infrastructure worked for Insteon um, when, they, when their users were connected to the same network. But basically, when their user was connected outside of the home Wi-Fi, it wouldn't work well and it would, it would drop packets and like the lights wouldn't turn on and off very well. So it just wasn't reliable. And so then when they came over and used PubNub for it, it solved all their issues and it was fast and secure now. So now I'm gonna kind of talk about my little Arduino house here. Now that you guys know a little bit more about, you know, kind of how PubNub works and, and now I can kind of explain how this thing works. So after thinking about where the industry is going, I wanted to try to replicate and see how easy it was to create your very own Internet of Things house, right? Like if you wanted to have all your devices connected, like how hard would it be to make? Um, and so for this demo, we wanted to have something that actually resembled an actual house. And the first step was to find a CAD project file that we could laser cut into an actual house. So the design, it was only $15, and we bought it, and we got a two-hour lesson on laser cutting. And so we got uh, the design laser cut at a local hacker space uh, with the proper equipment, and it only took a few hours to complete. The material is made out of yucca board, and it's a particle board that's, uh, used from, that's made from harvesting eucalyptus, which actually makes it really cheap. And the thing is, it was actually really hard to cut with the laser cutter, um, and it requires a super high power laser that can basically go on the XY axis and burn through the material. Um, and then once we got everything cut, the process of building the house and gluing everything together uh, began. And it took some time, but the process was rewarding and it was a lot more fun than staring at a computer screen coding all day. And so then uh, we soldered the circuit together on the breadboard. Um, 
And if we were to do this over again, I probably would have used the free PCB software and I would have actually made like a custom circuit if I were to do it again. But we wanted to make this really quickly, so we just used a simple breadboard for it. Um, and then once the board was done, we basically plugged the wires into the Arduino chip, ran the software, and tested it out. And what was awesome is PubNub was actually able to successfully control the house. So once we plugged everything in, you can see everything's moving around, um, lights are turning on and off, et cetera. So the entire house is actually powered by this single Arduino Yoon chip. Um, there is a breadboard which basically connects the circuits together. And I basically wired up the breadboard to go to the Arduino. Um, and each connector is attached to the Arduino Yoon board. Each integer, um, this is on, actually on, all on GitHub if you guys want to check it out. It's open source. Um, it controls a different element of the house. So in the code, we basically assigned uh, each number to a different you know, open port on the Arduino chip. So after the assembly was complete, the house was painted PubNub red, and we decided to leave the roof open so you know, observers could basically see the inner workings of the Arduino and the light switches. And basically, this project, it's working in real time through a web app and PubNub. So when you click the front door button on the web app, PubNub sends a published message out to a channel called uh, PubNub IoT House. And then, uh, and then the Arduino is using the PubNub SDK to subscribe to that channel. So basically, right now, the Arduino is connected to the internet. So it'll receive the published message instantly when I, when I use it from the mobile app. And this is really actually how simple the code is. Uh, when you click the jQuery button on the, on the web app, it basically just sends a published message to the PubNub IoT house channel, and then it, uh, by passing which button you click in there. So that, that's really how simple PubNub is to, to get something up and running. So um, the entire project, like I said earlier, open source. You can check it out. Um, and then I wanted to kind of give a little demo showing you guys how this works. This is what the Arduino board looks like when you log in. Um, let's see here. OK. So the thing is, right now, I, I was trying it out the other day. Unfortunately, someone else was playing around with it, and they broke the servo motors, so the garage door is not working. However, the light switches are working. And if you even want, you can go to this URL, and you can control it yourself from your mobile phone. Um, but as you can see, like I'll go down here to the demo. And I don't know if you guys, can you guys see that? Can you guys see the lights going on and off? Um, let me turn on the left light. You guys see that, that turned on? Off. On, off. Kind of cool, right? So that's, that's, all using, that's just all using PubNub. Um, so it basically, this is just sending a published message out. PubNub is receiving that message and figuring out the fastest route to get that data here. So you can have thousands, millions of IoT devices connected. Um, the PubSub protocol, you can also use it for a ton of other things. And I just wanted to show you guys another little demo. Um, so since I'm a video game developer, I wanted to kind of create a multiplayer video game using PubSub technology. So this is kind of what I came up with, and I figured you guys would be interested in checking it out as well, because you can do a lot of stuff with this, with this protocol. Let's, let's see here. So this is my ninja multiplayer platformer game. And so you can go to that link, bit.ly PubNub game, and check it out. And so as you can see, I'm on the right side. Uh, that's me. I'm, I'm the little ninja guy. And as you can see on the left side, uh, the guy's moving around in real time. So this is all using the same technology that's powering this. Um, but you can also make a game with it. So there's tons of different things you can, you can use with, with PubSub. Yeah, so what I'm actually doing here, um, you have to do some kind of smart logic. So with game development, it's really tough because you basically have to predict where the, where the player is going to move before the players actually move there. So we're doing some inter extrapolation to basically, uh, to basically predict the player's movement. So the only time that I'm sending a published message is actually when I press the down arrow right. So that's moving my player right. And then the other screen got that information. So it's, it, it, it simulates the player moving right. And then I'll send another packet of information when I release the key, um, basically saying, stop moving, and then the other client will receive that. So that's kind of just how it works. That's about the end of my presentation. I don't know if you guys, do you guys have any questions? No? Yeah?
Yeah. Yeah, so you can do that all through like the console. Um, and you can do it programmatically as well. You can block certain keys. You can block certain users. Every user that's connected has a specific UUID with their token information, with like their device information. So you can go through and basically ban certain people that are, you know, maybe disrupting your network or abusing it. Yeah, it's all controlled. So it's free to. It's yeah. So it's free to start out. Um, like I think it's a million messages a month for free, which is a lot. So if you're like a small business, like you can run your entire like thing basically for free with PubNub. Um, then it starts getting tiered. So if you go over a million, then it's like fifty dollars a month, and then it just kind of goes up from there. So I mean, we have like com customers like Pocket Gems, which is like one of the biggest like mobile gaming companies like around in the Bay Area, and they're sending you know I, I look up on the board, they're sending hundreds of thousands of messages like a, a second. So it's like so it's like we have big customers like that that are sending a lot of information. Um, and then we have other customers that only need to, like IoT devices don't send a lot of information. Like, right, like you only need to be fetching that data every once in a while. So PubNub is a really great option because it's inexpensive and, and it's really reliable. Um, so that, it is. Yeah, we're doing really well right now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of companies use this just because it saves them time and they just don't have the infrastructure, right, to basically set this up themselves. And it's a lot easier on their engineers, so they're able to basically push out the content really, really quickly. So it's a huge advantage. We're, we're basically the leader in the space when it comes to PubSub. Does, does anyone else have any questions or, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So like in, sh yeah, so in shooter games, usually like, so this is using TCP, right? And so for games, you usually most of the time don't want to use TCP for like the, the Twitch shooters. You want to use UDP, right? Because with UDP, you're able to push, 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 push. And even if one packet gets lost, uh, you can just kind of throw it away and the next one will come. But with TCP, you actually have to receive a response back. So it's a little bit different and you kind of have to do some creative things to basically make it work. But um, I, like, there are gaming customers that do use us and that really, really benefit from our service. So it's like, it just depends on what type of game. For turn-based games, we're really good. Like if you're trying to create like a words with friends or like a you know, something like that. For, for real-time games, it, this, this gets a little tricky. This is a cool demo, but I, I made it actually very efficient, so it wouldn't cost a lot of money to run. Um, however, it's probably not the best use case. It'd probably, you'd probably be better off, you know, doing it with only turn-based games. Yeah. Yeah, so we so we've done like we've had like a, the government do do a contract with us. They wanted like a private network, and so we were able to make that happen. Um, and then in terms of just security, like I don't know, we're HIPAA compliant. So like if you're trying to build like a healthcare application, um, like we, we have Athena Health that's a customer, and they and you know that that's very hard to get a healthcare customer to be a client of yours because they they need that secure data. But we support that, um, and then we have like AES, you know, all the standard or above standard encryption, along with our company SOC2 compliant. So yeah, I don't, does that answer your question? Yeah, so big big corporate customers that need that security, they, they, they use us, um, yeah. Anyone else have any questions? No, no? Does anyone, did anyone try out the house or no? Was anyone able to control it? Yeah, let me, uh, let's see here. There it is. How do I do that? Thanks, man. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for coming. Pubnub.github.io. Where? Thank you, guys. Thank you.